We're in Daniel chapter 5 as we move through this great prophetic book. And again, there's a lot of great prophecy in here as we look at this uh, book given through the prophet Daniel. Let's come to the Lord right now in our prayers before we jump into Daniel. We always want God to touch our hearts. And Father, Lord, we do come before you this morning. We come as a form of worship, as we worship you. And the, the words you gave to us are your words through the prophet Daniel. We thank you for that. Let them impact our heart in a major way, life-changing way, that we can see you in all of this and then properly give you the glory and honor. And we do these things through your sons, through his blood. Amen. Daniel chapter 5, I've labeled this, There is a Man. Uh, I pulled it out, one of the verses, uh, simply because it impacted me. Uh, because we'll look into Daniel, we'll see why. But there is a man. And of course, I don't want to exclude women. So if anybody says, well, what about women? Uh, well, I'm picking this out. Uh, you know, it's funny, I did go look at various versions of the Bible. Because you know how modern they're getting? I said, I wonder if anybody has changed this to, There is a person. Thankfully, I didn't find one, but I'd only looked at about two dozen, so, you know, anyway, uh, that's just me looking around, but uh, there is a man, and of course, that man is Daniel. Look at verse um, one. Just, we'll start there, because I want to kind of bounce into a little history of the Babylonian kings, not because that's all exciting, but we need the background to this. Verse 1, Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. Right away, we're introduced to this guy named Belshazzar, the king. Now, we, chapter 4, we were with Nebuchadnezzar, the king. We don't get any introduction. We don't get any history. We just bang. Here's Belshazzar, and a lot of people, who's Belshazzar? And so it's important, I think, to know a little bit about what has happened, because if you look at the screen, you'll see in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar's reign was for about 43 years, and he died in 562 B.C. As you know, the relationship between Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar from our last lesson was probably pretty good, sort of friendly in the way he talked to them. Anyway, even when he brought judgment... Remember he said, I, I wish this judgment was on your enemies and not on you. Remember that? And that's showing compassion for Nebuchadnezzar, even though he sinned greatly by elevating himself uh, over the most high God. And then we can look at the succession. Now, most of these guys are either son-in-laws or direct descendants, meaning sons or grandkids. It's, so it's all in the family. Of course, it's no family you want to be a part of because it's, it's filled with intrigue. It's filled with a son-in-law killing the son and this one kills the other and he steals this person. So it's, it's really kind of messed up the way it is. But, and, and a lot of these people are in our uh, Bible elsewhere. I'm not going to go there and take you. End of Jeremiah is a great place to look if you want. Second Kings at the end if you want to write those down. You'll see some of these names mentioned, but I'm not sure they're pertinent to this section. So evil Merodach or Emil Merodach ruled for one year. Uh, and then Neraglasa from 559 to 556, and then Labasi Marduk, 556, three months, short reign. You can imagine what happened to him. <laughs> and then we finally come to Nabonidus, Nabonidus uh, 555 to 539. I want you to see this because Daniel had a prominent role under Nebuchadnezzar, but then he kind of fades into the background. We don't hear much about him, anything he did under the rule of any of the other kings. And so that's probably, you know, how many years is that? 25, 30 years before Daniel rises up, this godly man. Doesn't mean he wasn't doing anything. He was just fading into the background until God needed him. The book of Daniel is not primarily about Daniel. It's about God. 
God, and the whole Bible is about God. He's the center, not us, not man. It's all about who he is. And so Daniel's a great example of this. But he fades into the background uh, until God calls him forward. He's serving in the background. He was chief administrator, at least under Nebuchadnezzar. He may have been demoted as the new kings came in. But Daniel's watching all this. He's observing the dynasty and the real mess they had got. He's watching the culture do this, going downhill. It does. That was my point. We're in, a, we're in a slide also, I would believe. And Daniel is watching and observing and serving. And he's ready. That's the point. He's ready to be serving. He's ready to go when God wants him to go and to come forward. If you look at the last one, I've indented it because Belshazzar ruled during the time of, they say, about 553 to 539. That's at the same time as Nabonidus. Okay, and so what we're seeing here is a co-regency. They were ruling at the same time. We have two kings. King number one is Nabonidus. King two would be Belshazzar. And so uh, that's important to note when we get into the, the text. And Belshazzar says to Daniel, I'll make you the third ruler, third position. Why third? Nabonidus is number one. Belshazzar would be number two. So he can't give him either of those. So he'll make him number three. And so that's his offer, which we'll see Daniel strongly, you know, uh, sets aside and doesn't want anything to do with it. And both Nabonidus and Belshazzar, their reigns end in 539. We'll talk about that. But what happens, as we will see in this passage, the Babylonian dynasty comes to an end on this very night. But remember, Daniel's position, he's ready to be used by God. Nabonidus was quite a traveler, quite a traveler. He, he, quite, he would go off to the wars, he would go, go off to different places, and so he had his son stay in the city of Babylon to kind of keep things under control, and so that's why he had a second uh, ruler. And so let's look at the reign of Belshazzar in relationship to Daniel. Uh, we'll notice something. In 553 B.C., Daniel wrote the words in Daniel 7, 1, in chapter 7, 553, near the beginning of his ministry, Daniel writes that, given this information from God. In 550, Daniel writes chapter 8. You'll see that in verse 1, the third year of Belshazzar. Chapter 5, when was that written? Well, at the very end of Belshazzar's ministry. And it's the end because that's when Belshazzar was slain. What does that tell us about this book? What does that tell us about Daniel? It tells us that he's not so interested in chronology at this point. Don't take that to mean he's not interested in chronology at all. He is very much. Because Daniel, within his chapters, talks about the times of the Gentiles and gives very specific chronology. And then in chapter 9, very specific chronology. But as far as the ordering of these books, he has done it based on themes. He wants to relay to the readers themes. And so he has positioned this in a particular way. And we've looked at those themes in the past. And we, if you remember, I keep bringing this up as we move through it, the chiastic outline, sort of like a sandwich on the outside, the Gentile timeline or the times of the Gentiles are on the two bookends. Beginning in chapter 2, we have the statue, which tells about the times of the Gentiles on, on the left-hand side, so to speak. And then we have the times of the Gentiles running down the other, uh, and that would be with the four beasts. And so they mirror one another. Then we move in a little bit, and we see both chapter 3 and chapter 6 are about the Jewish persecution. First with the fiery furnace, and then with Daniel and the lion's den, and how God protected them and brought the Jewish people. That's the theme. 
through persecution. And of course, we know he has done that for many years, many years, and will continue to bring the Jewish people through persecution, including the greatest, perhaps, persecution to come. But I want you to notice in the very center of all of this, and, and like I can't stress it enough, is the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God over everything. The Jewish people, the Gentile people. Chapter 4 was Nebuchadnezzar getting up, standing on his palace roof, saying, oh, look what I built. God said, uh-uh, you didn't build that. Great lesson for us. If we look over our lives, you didn't build that. Give God the honor. Chapter 5, we're going to see, here's Belshazzar, and, and he is going to learn that God is sovereign over his reign, too. Now here's Belshazzar feasting it up, perhaps saying, look, look, we know he's prideful because God says he won't humble himself. God says, let me show you who's boss. Again, right at the center. The book of Daniel emphasizes God's sovereignty over world affairs, probably like no other book, if I can go there. So if we can pick one thing out of Daniel, yes, all the chronology is great, and the eschatology is great, and where God is sovereign over what's happening in this world. Not only that, he's sovereign over each one of our lives, and we need to know that no matter what we're going through in life. And we will go through some things where we look at God and say, why God? I know I have many times. But we have to rest and he knows what he's doing. And he's directly involved. Last night I was listening to Christian radio, which is always fun. I listen to the words and I don't know who does that. <laughs> and you get bouncing around with the tune and that's all you hear. Let's listen to this song. I won't tell you the name of the song. You may know it just because of what I'm going to say, but it says, the main theme running through it was, Lord, I give you control. Lord, I give you control. Now, some of you may know this song, and I hope not to offend you, but it was on, you know, Christian radio. It is great. But I thought about that, and I said, I, that's wrong. That's wrong. I can't give God control because... He already has it. That's bad theology. That's incorrect thinking. But how many of us in the world today, Christians included, think that? God, I'm, I'm going to let you take the steering wheel. He's looking at you saying, well, I already have it. You know, God is in control. We need to recognize that. And, and, that, and that's probably a theme in this passage. So if you're going through something, he's driving you through that that tragedy, that area on purpose to teach you something. I counsel a lot of people over the years and they say, it's not why, it's what does God want you to learn through this? As difficult as it may be, and I've seen some difficult things that I don't have the answer why, but I try to work with the people on what do you need to learn from God in all of this, whether it's a death in the family or unemployment or anything that happens? God is in control. He's got this. We need to learn that. Something else that's interesting in this section of the book is some, what I call the Babylonian Chronicle, and some people call it the Babylonian Cuneiform. These are tablets that were discovered in and around 1860. Written by the Chaldeans, who we know from Daniel. They're the brilliant wise men, right? But they could write and they jotted down history. They found them in an area in Iraq. Some people think it might have been Nineveh. But they found these tablets. And they give a Babylonian history. So this is secular. And it gives a history of Babylonian kings and all the things that happened from 747 about to 226 BC. History's written out. I bring that up because many things that they found in these tablets supported and verified Daniel with no contradiction. Isn't that great? I love it when that, every time they find something, it, it, it always supports scripture. For many, many, many years, 
Up until the time of this finding, they thought Belshazzar was made up by Daniel because they could not have any record of who this guy Belshazzar was. And they said, see, Daniel made it up. Well, guess whose name they found in the Babylonian tablets. <laughs> you got it. Belshazzar. There he is. God's right again. The Bible's always right. The interesting thing they found on, the, on these tablets also was the name met Nebuchadnezzar. He wrote out a prayer to the moon god. It caught my attention. The last king, official king perhaps of Babylon, has an affection for the moon god. That's why he traveled a lot, because the main god in Babylon was Marduk, not the moon god. And they didn't like the moon god as much. So he had to go to a place called, you may know it, Haran? Yeah, Haran. Yeah, you know Abraham up there, but the moon god. Now, I was fascinated that, and I'm scratching my head still on that, because you know, I know Islam is going to play a, a major role in end times. I'm convinced of it, and I'll show that to you as we move through chapter 7 and following. But who does Islam have as a symbol in there? The moon. The crescent moon. So it's very interesting. Is there a hint? Is there a connection I should make? You know, is there foreshadowing? I don't know yet, but I just find that fascinating. Okay, let's dig into our scripture here, and we'll move through what I'm going to call the drunken orgy. It's basically what it is. Yeah. Let's go to verse 2 since we read verse 1. This is Belshazzar's feast. He puts on a feast. Verse 2. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which he had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives, his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, his concubines, drank from them. They drank wine, praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. A feast, a banquet, drunken orgy, I call it. This is, this is his last day of his life. Now, you have to understand what's going on in his country. His country is under attack. Actually, he has the Medes and the Persians outside the city gates of Babylon at this time. The Medes and the Persians had already conquered most of the empire of Babylon, and there they are sitting on the doorstep trying to figure out how to get in. What does Belshazzar do? Let's have a party! Now, maybe it's to make his men and his lords and his nobles feel like they're secure. Don't worry about it. Under control. But the enemy is slowly closing in. Now Babylon, you may or may not know, is a tremendous city. Some argument of how big it actually was, but the walls themselves, and somewhere around 80, 85 feet wide. You know, they talk about having chariot races for a breast on top. That's pretty wide. And there's some people that say they were 300 to 350 feet tall. That would be a football field. That's pretty tall. Pretty tall, pretty wide. Bronze gates. Here is Belshazzar inside this fortress of a city, feeling quite secure. Look what has been built. Nobody can touch me as the world comes crashing in. He's having a banquet for his people, perhaps to encourage uh, them in all of this. Banquet for a thousand. Not unusual in those times to have gatherings of that nature. I, I read one place in history where there was 62,000 at a banquet. That's a big banquet. That's a football field. But this one's only a thousand. And in fact, in archaeology, they found ruins showing that there was actually in Babylon a a banquet hall that would fit a thousand. It was like, it was like uh, 60, 70 feet by 172, 175 feet. And somewhere in the middle of it, it was a little raised platform and there's pictures of the digs that exactly a king could sit there. I love it when I see that kind of stuff. 
So I envision Belshazzar sitting there with his wives, his concubines. Notice the word drinking. Did you see that? Did you count? I did. Five times in four verses. Five times how alcohol plays a life in this kind of a living. I could preach a whole sermon just on that one, but we won't. But it just shows the, what's going on in this banquet. It's very ungodly. Marv Rosenthal said licentious. Very sinful what's going on. And then he goes and he has the audacity to tell him to go get the gold vessels that his father had taken from Jerusalem some 40 years ago. They'd been in storage. His father wouldn't, didn't have, wasn't going down that road, but Belshazzar goes, go, go, go get them. And that's important because it shows you how far Belshazzar had fallen. And it's going to play an impact on how Daniel talks to him. Nebuchadnezzar had a respect for Daniel, maybe even for his people. But he did for the God Most High, El Elyon. But Belshazzar has nothing to do with the God of Israel. Go get those cups. Let's drink wine. Let's make God's things part of our drunken orgy. They praised the pagan idols. They demeaned Yahweh. Blasphemous, profaned him. It was all done on purpose. He was demonstrating his arrogance, his power, his pride. Sinful. It doesn't sound a whole lot different than our world today. Do you know what the number one thing that people want in this world right now? It used to be money. But now it's pleasure. Pleasure. We want to play. That's why our young people don't want to go back to work. They found that they can stay home and play on the various devices we give them. It doesn't matter what it is. This is what's going on in this party. One big party. That's what life is. It doesn't matter what's happening in the world around us. Remember, it's crashing in on him. Let's play. Let's party. Let's have some pleasure. The world is crawling, crumbling apart around us today and Satan is coming in and coming in until someday he will break down the wall. As God allows, he will break down that wall. I thought about that wall. That wall was made of, of material that they thought could never be broken and, the, and it was eventually, but not by the Persians. But I thought about what kind of walls have we built? Have we built a wall built of money? We think money will provide security and keep the enemy out. Has it been like these people? Has it been pleasure? You know, what kind of walls have we put up that we think will protect us from the world? God is in control. You know, when we look at Belshazzar, we, we look at a man who is thumbing his nose at God, taunting him. Mocking him. No wonder he has a judgment for Belshazzar. And again, I look at our world today. Are we not doing the same thing? In many areas, we're mocking God. Taunting him. You know, some 500, 560 years later, they would do the same thing to Jesus, remember? There in the scourging, and they put the crown and a robe of purple on him. Belshazzar's day, they're doing it to God, Yahweh, here in Jesus' day, they're doing it to the Son of God himself. Spit on him, mocked him, made fun of him. That's what sinful man does. This picture of Belshazzar and his orgy in this Babylon is it's prophetic of what's coming. If you want to turn for a moment to Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 5, we'll look at it briefly. But here we're seeing a city called Mystery Babylon. Mystery. So the Babylon that's about to fall in Daniel's day is a type of a Babylon that's going to fall in our future, but near future, of a Babylonian empire of the same sorts. 
But look at how in verse 1 it describes this Babylon. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Incidentally, that's a term that could be associated with the river Euphrates, was also known as that. A lot of great connections. Verse 2, this great harlot with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Does that sound familiar? So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy. Against the taunting, the mocking, the profaning of God himself. Having seven heads, ten horns, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. She thought she was the queen of the world, adorned with gold and precious stones and silver, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of Hollots, and of the abominations of the earth. Belshazzar was a prophetic insight into what's going to happen when that Antichrist and the harlot get together and rise up. Expect to see a similar situation as they lull the world. See, all the inhabitants of the world are going to be pulled into this. And it'll be one big party as they martyr the saints and the Christians and the Jews that they can get after. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 5. I want to look at verse 5. Before I get there, though, just remember as, as much as we may party. I love this verse in James chapter 5. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. No matter what happens in our lives, no matter what's going on in the world, the judge is there at the door. And I almost want to say he's got one foot through the door. He's coming. We need to live our lives in light of that. Forget what the world's offering. Let's look at what God's, God's coming soon. Well, verse 5, I call this one God shows up. He wasn't invited to the party. Actually, he was told not to come. The uninvited guest. But he's coming. And for those who want to reject God and taunt him and mock him and pretend he doesn't exist, one day he will show up. He will show up. He does what Belshazzar. His days are coming to an end very surely. And look, look at verse 5. In the same hour... The fingers of a man's hand appeared. Imagine that being at the party, <laughs> drinking and all of this. And the walls were plastered. And a hand, or fingers of a hand appear, and they begin to write. You can imagine that, couldn't you? Just imagine that behind me. You see these fingers starting to write letters. Opposite the lampstand, and that's important because it's very visible right in front of the light so all the thousand people can see who are sitting there. Opposite the lamp stand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened. You can imagine what that... Some of you may have already had that. And <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't mean that. <laughs> His knees knocked together. You can visualize that one. He's shaking in his boots when he sees all that. Well, he's shaking his boots. Let's just stop there for a minute because here we're seeing God speak. God shows up in mysterious ways sometimes, doesn't he? Why didn't God just kill him on the spot? Why did he choose to write on the wall? Fingers. Writing on, why did he do that? God always does things for a reason. Why did God show up in a bush with Moses? Why did God speak through a donkey? You know, God speaks in a lot of different ways to a lot of people, and, and, and I think a lot of it is to make it memorable for us. Because we will never forget 
the handwriting on the wall. We, we got that. That's for us. This will not be the last time God does finger painting. If you recall Jesus, what did he do? Got down in the sand and he did what? He used his fingers, probably to write out the sins of the Pharisees who were ready to stone the woman. Not the first, not the last time. But God does things so that we will remember them because he knows we are forgetful people. He could have killed them and that would have gone right out of history would have forgot. But he knows what it takes to get a person's attention, and that did. But he also knows how to make it memorable. So God speaks, not only to Belshazzar, but to us. Well, verse 7. Let's move into what I call the wisdom of the world. I hate to call it even wisdom. But let's read it, verse 7 through 9. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men, and I'll put a parenthesis around that one, wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck. He shall be the third ruler, is the third ruler, in the kingdom. Now all the king's wise men came in. I can imagine them just trancing in one by one, this whole group of scholars. I don't know why he kept them around. I really don't. How useful were they around the statue? I don't know what that means. Okay, how about the tree? Don't know. Well, let's try it again. I mean, these guys would be long gone. Useless. You know, the wisdom of the world should have no place in a Christian's life. And I'm not discarding all, like, scientific discovery and all of that stuff. But I'm when, when it comes to the meaning and the purpose and the difficulties and the walk in our lives, why do we waste our time with the world? Yet many times we go back like this Nebuchadnezzar did twice, like Belshazzar goes again. They keep going back and they go back and they don't get the answers because they're going to the wrong place. If we're struggling with life, we need to find ourselves godly people that can give us and help us navigate Scripture and explain to us what God has for us. Not the wise men of the world. We need to find Bible counselors. I've talked to many people. Have you looked at your problem? Yeah, I went to this psychologist and this psychiatrist and they gave me these pills and they worked for a while. Like, what are you doing? Going to the wise men of the world. Here you go. You want the answer to life's problems? Let's talk about where it is and how you need to get there. They'll get there. They'll call Daniel in in a minute. And they will. But let's, let me finish this. Verse 8. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing. It's impossible for the world to understand God. They, they can't do it. They're unable. Verse 9. Then the king Belshazzar I was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed. His Lords were astonished. They're all sitting there. There is a man. There is a man. Verse 10, the queen, because of the words of the king and the lords, came to the banquet hall. She wasn't there. She may have said, I'm not having any part of this debauchery. It's not my thing. And it's very likely the queen. We don't know exactly who she is. Some people think that it's the it's wife of Nebuchadnezzar. Perhaps some think it's maybe a daughter who had risen to be a queen. We don't know. But she had some very wise words. And it's evident from what she says she knew Daniel. So maybe she was there when Nebuchadnezzar talked to Daniel. We won't know. Going back to scripture, the queen spoke saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom, in whom is the Spirit of the Holy God. Wouldn't you love to have that title? There is a man, there is a woman, in whom the Spirit of the Holy God, who has the answers. Now, we're not able to interpret dreams and interpret all that kind of stuff, but you know what? We know where the answers are. If you have the Spirit of God in you, and I pray that you do, because all Christians do, then you could be that man or woman for that person who's struggling just like Daniel's about to do. 
Continuing, and in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king. And when they used the word father in, in those days, they didn't have a word for grandfather, so it could be any lion lineage descendant. Your father made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding, interpretation, dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar, now let Daniel be called, and he will give you the interpretation. Verse 13. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said, Daniel, are you... That Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah, we learned right away that he did not recognize Daniel, so he was not part of his crew that would advise him. Somehow Daniel had gotten so far away from the administration part. Some people think he might have retired, because it's been a number of years, and it's thought that Daniel at this time was 81. 81. How many of you might have hit 81 and said, hey, I'm done ministering? Uh, not Daniel. No, it should anybody. If you were called upon, no matter what age, bring your wisdom of God with you as Daniel did. Are you Daniel? One of the exiles. Never lost that. Never lost that. Remember, it's 539 B.C. We know from records. It's 539 B.C. Daniel came maybe in 605. Wait a minute, that's like 65 years later, they're still saying you're one of the exiles. Never lost that title, one of the captives. They asked him to make an interpretation. The king said to Daniel, verse 14, I have heard of you that the spirit of God is in you, that the light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of you, whether it's through is the queen or whether it's other circumstances we don't know, I have heard of you that you can give interp interpretations that explain enigmas. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Wow, that's pretty good. Now, Daniel walks in, of course, and just picture this. He walks in, he probably noticed the writing on the wall. <laughs> right? Obvious to everybody. There's a lampstand. You can picture a lampstand across from the wall, and there is lit up, probably in front of the king. He calls it, he looks at it. I'll bet you he knew exactly what that meant right then and there. And here's Daniel being offered third ruler of the kingdom and scratching his head saying, it's going to be a very short reign as a third ruler of the kingdom, right? Because <laughs> he knows exactly what's coming as he stands there. But he also, it's interesting to see how he addresses um, Belshazzar. Very different than Nebuchadnezzar. Remember last time, very compassionate and understanding, you know, Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar, if you, if you change your ways and do this and that, you know, perhaps God won't bring this upon you. Not so here. He walks into Belshazzar and, and he says, look at that in verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself. That's pretty direct. Right to the, right to the point. Give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the, what is writing to the king and make known to you the interpretation. I think at this point, Daniel probably saw the, or heard of the goblets or the vessels there of gods taken from the, from the temple. He could see what was going on in that room or he heard of it. They didn't invite Daniel. Not that Daniel would have gone to such an event anyway nor should any Christian. But he saw that, and there's something different, because right now Belshazzar is thumbing his nose at the most holy high God. He is, Daniel, I'm sure, in some sense, was filled with anger. And he knew the time was coming. It's too late for you, Belshazzar. 
There's no sense telling you how to make this right because the judgment that you see up here on the wall is coming down. So forget the gifts, forget the position. Let me tell you what it says. Well, before we get there, I need to tell you about your father. This is important. I call it lessons from the past. Lessons from the past. It begins in verse 18. O king, the most high God, El Elyon, gave, don't miss this, because this is all about God's sovereignty. He gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor, and because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and language trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. Whomever he wished, he put down. So again, he starts with Nebuchadnezzar's being granted his position, his power, his place in the world as a world leader was given to him by God, El Elyon, God the Most High. Got that, Belshazzar? Now, it's thought that Belshazzar was probably a teenager at the time of Nebuchadnezzar. And he could have been there. More than likely, he saw his father's empire that he somehow ended up getting. He might have even known this story and this account, but he certainly knew what his father or grandfather had for power. Daniel's making sure he knows where it came from. Because it's the same person that you're mocking who gave you, you your power. We can't forget that lesson. He's reminding him before judgment hits. Verse 20. But when his heart, Nebuchadnezzar's heart, was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beast. His dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the most high God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. Whomever he chooses. Okay, that's the history lesson. Let's move on to you now, Belshazzar. But you, says that twice in this paragraph, but you, Never a good thing. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though he saw all the lessons of his father, although you knew all this. And if you look at the list here, you'll see, but you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. You have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven, the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways. I just love that last verse, 23. The God who holds your breath, our breath, he holds it in his hand. Not only that, he owns, possesses all of our ways. Clearly, we ought to give him glory and honor. Amen? Amen. Daniel's making that very clear here. He holds it. What a tremendous statement about God. It reminded me, and I'll go very quickly here because of time, of Jonathan Edwards. I don't know if you know who Jonathan Edwards is and the Great Awakening that hit New England. And they credit this one message that he gave in Connecticut called Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. Have you ever read it? Yeah. You ought to. It's free online. Just, just go read it. Well, Jonathan Edwards, when he gets to the end and near the end and he's applying it to people's lives, I, I lifted out a couple of verses I thought might be pertinent to this. You have offended him infinitely more than ever. Boy, does this apply to Belshazzar, but also us. And yet, it is nothing but his hand that holds you from the fire every moment. And if you read the text, it tells like holding a spider over the pits of hell. The only reason God does not drop you is because of his sovereign power and grace. Understand who God is. There is no other reason to be given why you have not dropped into hell since you rose in the morning. No reason. 
All sinners should have been cast into hell, just like Belshazzar. No reason you should have been killed the moment you pulled those vessels out. No reason. But God's hand has held you up. Let us never forget that. So like the hand of God is on all of our lives. Well, God's going to have his... Let's quickly go through the interpretation here. <clears throat> Verse 24, Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and the writing was written. This is the inscription that was written. Verse 25, and it says, Many, many tekel of harson. That's my best translation in Aramaic. Uh, this is the interpretation of each word. Many, God is numbered. Remember the word numbered. Your kingdom. And finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. That's pretty clear. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and they clothed Daniel with purple, put a chain of gold around his neck, made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. If I was Daniel standing there, and I had just given this proclamation of God and told him he was going to be killed, I'd be saying, what are you doing? Putting a robe on me and purple and all that. Did you not hear what I just said? It shows you the blindness of Belshazzar's sin. I'm not sure you still got it. Thank you for the interpretation. That's wonderful. It's like saying you're condemned to hell and going to die. Oh, well, here, let me lavish gifts upon you. I'm like, what? I'm puzzled by his. But it just shows you what sin does to, a, to people in all of this. Now, they say that the Chaldeans couldn't read or interpret. A lot of discussion on what read means because the Chaldeans weren't that stupid they couldn't read. So a lot of people say, well, it must be another language. Perhaps. I mean, we don't know why. But it came upon a fascinating discussion that shows that, you know, when you write the language of the Syriacs or the Chaldeans or even the Hebrew, uh, the old Hebrew left out vowels. We see the word mene, mene, but the E's are inserted, and so it would look something like this, M, N, apostrophe, mene, 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 tekel, and parson. Right? Now you get it, see? You couldn't read it at first. A lot of people think maybe it was like that because you read the old languages from right to left, right? Not like left to right, and so, they left out the vowels, but even if they could get it in it, what does numbered, weighed, divided mean? Numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. They would look at that, and, but since they couldn't read it, so perhaps it's either that or God just skipped the third grade writing class. <laughs> I don't think that was it. So for some reason, they couldn't read it. They definitely couldn't interpret it, but Daniel does that for him. In other words, your, 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 your empire is coming to a close. You can write down Jeremiah 51, 11 to 13. You can see Jeremiah actually prophesied this. He named the conquerors of the Babylonian Empire years before it ever happened. Jeremiah 51, 11 to, thir 11 to 13. Continuing on, verse 30. <clears throat> that very night, that very night happened to be October 12, 539 BC. We've got a lot of verification on that and extra biblical records. And so we can nail it. But this is the last day of the reign. This is the last day of the Babylonian Empire. The dynasty collapses. And it collapses in a very unique way. Remember I showed you about Babylon? The normal way would be build siege ramps where you'd throw dirt against the wall. But, you know, 300 feet is kind of high. A lot of dirt. But a guy named Gubaru, Gubaru or Yugubaru, whichever way, I've seen it written two different ways. The commander of the Medes was operating under the authority of Cyrus the Persians. So you see the two of these working together. And he came up with a brilliant idea, because if you look at Babylon, this is very, very basic. This is my third way, way of writing out Babylon. The yellow is the walls around and the blue is the river Euphrates going through it. 
They had built quite a fortress. They could live there. Some people say 20 years worth of food, an unending resource of water. They thought they had it made. And what this guy Gubaro did under the authority of um, <coughs> Cyrus, they made a canal. They diverted the river Euphrates from going through the city. It dwindled down. Now, all of this is happening while they're partying. Okay? They had, where well, the water came in underneath the walls, they had bars coming down, but not all the way to the ground. So what did they do? Brought it down to what they say is knee length water, and the army simply just waltzed right in, both ends. They had position at both sides. The Medes and the Persians just walked right in and showed up at the party without even lifting or firing a shot. Just amazing how that all happened in the ingenuity. His empire, he was slain, as the Bible said. Notice, and I won't belabor this very long, is, is the notation there. Verse 31, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom. Great debate, volumes of books. Who's Darius the Mede? We can't find him anywhere. Similar to Belshazzar before the Babylonian Chronicles. Who is this Darius the Mede? Some people say, well, it's another name for Cyrus, which I'm going to say I don't think so. Some say it's a Darius that's totally unknown. As we look at um, Persian history, we'll see some Dariuses pop up. I don't think it's any of those. The best explanation, I think, it's a title. And it was given to the guy who conquered the city, because it's known that he did rule Babylon for Cyrus for a number of years. So I would say my best point would be it's this guy named Gubaru, the commander of the Medes army, which would make sense. So a title would receive the kingdom for the victory. Now as I get ready to close, I want to make a couple of points. We've pulled into our society a couple of what they call idioms. The handwriting on the wall. How many people don't know what that means? Most people know that it's coming to an end. Something bad is about to happen, according to Webster. Something bad's about to happen in the near future. We pull that in. But we forget sometimes who is bringing that something bad into the world. As far as our society goes today, the handwriting is on the wall. Beyond that, I would say the handwriting is in the book. It's right here. He had just a wall. We have an entire book. That's the handwriting of God that tells us what's going to happen. Your number is up. Ever hear that? Right? Many, many. Your number is up. We use that like nothing. We know what that means. You know, people are out there quoting scripture and they don't even know it. They don't even know it. You can use this. But the important thing I want to remember is we as Christians need to number our days. What do I mean by that? Make each day count. Make, e make today count. Number it. This is a day I'm going to do something for the Lord. This is the day I'm going to do something. Make each day count. Teach us to number our days. God has already numbered them. And we have a last day. And then we go to God. Well, in conclusion, let me just say a couple of things about our country. I think we're too secure. I think we think we're invincible. I think we've rejected God and his word. I think we have built our own walls of security that are not built on God. I think we've built walls of money, power, pleasure, whatever it is. I think as a country, the handwriting is on the wall. It is. And I don't want to really pick I love our country, but I fear for our country. And we should pray for our country. We know what God desires. Belshazzar knew. Daniel was quoting him scripture in chapter 5, even though he hadn't written it yet. We have and we know what God desires. We have the lessons. There is no excuse. Belshazzar had hit the end of the road and no excuses. He had lessons and its time is up. 
it's over. As long as we're alive, our time is not up. We need to tell the world about the handwriting on the wall. Father God, we thank you for this time together with the book of Daniel, with your word. Let us ever remember that you are sovereign. The center of the book, the center of this passage, the center of our lives, I hope. Pray that you will impact us, guide us, and control us as you see fit to go and tell a lost and dying world about the handwriting on the wall. We thank you, we love you, and we praise you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at one 888 781-9466. Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.